Hey everyone, Dr. Alex Ritza here, The Cycling Doc. Today's video is gonna give you a strength routine that you can do at home with a minimal amount of equipment in the off and on season with the goal of not necessarily making you a faster rider, but a stronger one. And by stronger, I mean somebody that's probably gonna be more injury resilient, somebody that's gonna have a larger bike fit window and be able to tolerate more stress and strain on the bike, and somebody that's gonna be a better human being off the bike so that if it is a hike, if it is a run, if it is doing something with your kids or going hiking, whatever it might be, you're gonna be able to do it without ruining your body. One thing about this video that is good is that it's not gonna require a lot of equipment. Obviously, if you are strength training and weightlifting, body weight is gonna be good for most circumstances, but it's one of those things that if you buy some equipment, it is probably gonna be quite helpful to help you get more gains as your strength improves. Without further ado, let's do it. So let's go over a few of those exercises. You guys will see them on the screen and I am gonna kinda of go over them and give you some pointers and some tips in a brief period of time. With our first exercise, we're gonna be doing an up dog, down dog flow, which is gonna be good for overall strength and stability through the shoulders. I'm gonna start in this one just by pedaling out the legs to take some stress off the hamstrings, the calves, the sciatic nerves. And with this, we wanna go nice and low and slow. We wanna make sure that we are being nice and controlled. And this is going to help in a closed change chain or body weight position to build a little bit more strength and stability through the shoulders and through your spine, which is not necessarily gonna be helpful for your off season on the bike when you're on the trainer, but maintaining some upper body strength and especially some control and movement through the shoulders, which will be important for any off-road event and in terms of on-road will be important with any quartering. It's gonna be very, very helpful very good to start off with that because it's going to be easier on your body and easy on the spine. The next drill we're going to go into is this reach back, which we've been over a million times. It is for strengthening the muscles between the shoulder blades in the thoracic and upper thoracic spine. Some of those muscles are going to help you build more uh, postural control, a more stacked up and healthy spine. It's important with this exercise that if you cannot get your butt onto your heels, you can put a pillow, which you'll see in a second, between buttock and heels. The important thing with this is to make sure that the low back does not move. If you maintain contact between the heels, it won't. And that all the motion is coming from the mid back. You should feel it predominantly between the shoulder blades. Between the shoulder blades and those spine muscles is where you're going to initiate the movement so while you have that hand in that one arm sphinx position between the knees, the movement's gonna be initiated in the spine between the shoulder blades and then the shoulder and the neck follow the spine. And when they follow the spine, you're gonna go as far as you can, pulling between the shoulder blades and holding that top position for say a half or a whole second. I typically will recommend starting off with one set of 10 per side. And then if you can do more, two sets, three sets, you can do so. This is one of those exercises where there's no increase in weight that you're gonna add. It's purely a body weight and control exercise. Our next exercise we're gonna go into is in for upper body control and stability, and it is a push up plus. This is where you wanna keep a straight line and a braced core between ear, shoulder, and hip. And ideally, all that's moving are the shoulder blades. When you push into the ground, the shoulder blades will come around the body. And then when you lower your body with straight arms, the shoulder blades will come back. This is gonna strengthen some of the scapular or shoulder blade stabilizers, like the serratus anterior, and a little bit, a little bit through some of the postural or, uh, shoulder stabilizers like the rotator cuff. It's really important with this one to keep a core braced, chin tucked to keep a nice straight stacked up spine. And then all of the motion comes from pushing the hands out and bringing the hands back. And the only thing that moves here are the shoulder blades 
where they protract around the body and retract back around the thorax. If you're finding that exercise too hard, you'll see that you can modify it by going onto your knees. The same principle applies where you want to keep a stacked up spine between ear, shoulder, and hip, a brace core, the spine shouldn't be moving too much, and we should be getting most of that motion from the shoulder blades moving around the spine. This exercise is going to be good for control of the bike, especially if you are climbing a lot, and is going to be really, really good if you're doing any uh, uh, off-road event, whether it's mountain bike, gravel, cyclocross, where there's a lot of force absorption as you're going over rocky terrain. And if you've ever done some sort of gravel event that is rough, you will know that at the end of that day and into the next day, that upper body is very, very sore from all of the force your body is having to absorb. If these muscles are stronger, it will make you better able to do that, more resilient through the race, and in this case, probably faster. So the next exercise we're gonna go over does require some equipment, and it might not be for everybody. It is a chop and a lift. This is gonna build some rotational resistance through the core, where we keep the core nice and engaged, and the shoulders are moving while the core is stable. In this exercise, what you should see is as I chop down, I will also push outwards a little bit with the hand. You can't see really great in this image, but just know that when I chop down, there's a little bit of a push at the end, and that's going to help to build some rotational resistance. And what I mean in that case is that you are able to move the shoulders around you without the core or the spine changing position. This of course is gonna be really, really important on a bicycle if you are sprinting or if you are climbing out of the saddle or if you're doing an off-road event where you are out of the saddle, where you wanna keep your spine and your core obviously facing forward and the shoulders are moving or controlling the bike around you. This is going to build some resistance where your spine is not twisting, your glutes are not twisting, you're not losing power delivery into the pedals because you have a, a weak core that is moving too much. This is one of those analogies that if the core is moving too much, it's kind of like firing a cannon from a canoe. You're not gonna have good power transfer between the bike uh, handlebars through the core into the pedals. So the other option with this exercise is to do a lift, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, this one does require some equipment. This is a resistance band that I got from a, a course that I did, SFMA. Uh, I think the S or FMS website also sells this band. You can do this exercise on one knee, or in this case, two knees. Two knees is easier than one knee. Again, the important thing is that the core and the trunk face forward and that there is no twisting through the trunk. And in this image here, you will see a little bit more of that push outward as I descend down through the chop. Before we get into the lift, I think it's important to make note that in terms of other equipment you can use, if you can't get this specific band, you could probably use a regular old TheraBand where if you grab it in two locations, you'll be able to stretch it and give a little bit of a push or stretch it and give a little bit of a push and still get a similar exercise. You could also do it without a band with say a kettlebell. It might just not provide the continual resistance that you're looking for. The important thing as you can see here as we move into the lift is that it's the, uh, the opposite motion where we're lifting up. The thing that you're resisting is the rib cage popping upwards. We wanna make sure we engage the core, keep the spine nicely stacked up, ear, shoulder, and hip in line, is that when you lift up, those core muscles are resisting the urge uh, of the spine to arch itself backwards. That is going to again build some uh, rotational resistance and that is going to help probably as you pull the pedal over, making sure that the bike does not shift and move. This is gonna be a little bit more applicable in a sprint, um, whether on flat ground or racing up a hill. 
So with the lift and chop, those are a little bit less essential in my mind to do. I think they're important core exercises, but if you can't get the equipment to do them, not the end of the world. Now, next exercises we're gonna go through are a little bit more traditional. I think everybody, no matter what they do, should be doing a squat. If you need help with squatting, I would check out the video that's gonna be listed below called Corrective Exercise One. That's gonna teach you how to do a squat. The important thing with the squat is that I would say four things. When you descend, you push the knees outward, you keep the core engaged and the spine tall. The first thing that happens is you hip hinge backwards and that you sit the butt down like you're trying to sit into a chair. Uh, in this video, I have a kettlebell in hand. I would start off with body weight and slowly build up more weight as you become more comfortable. The squat is something that we could do an hour long video on. The purpose of it is, this video's purpose is not to go over how to do it. It's just to let you know that you should be doing it. Uh, next uh, important exercise is a lunge. Now the lunge is gonna help build a lot of strength uh, through the hamstrings and the quads. And for me, I think is an important thing for injury resistance, especially with force distribution through the pedals. So this exercise is a little bit more eccentric which does not correlate or move directly to the concentric or pushing contraction that we do on a bike. But eccentric contraction has much higher force tolerance. And if you can tolerate that and build strength in this way, most people are gonna be able to tolerate more on the bike in terms of uh, force expenditure, intensity, duration, and should be more injury resilient. Same principles always apply, core is engaged. We wanna keep the spine nicely stacked up and that when you lower yourself down, that spine position should not change. The knee should lower itself to the ground fairly vertical, and when you push up, you should feel the glutes engage. In this video, you can see me moving forward and backwards. Sometimes I will lunge to and forward, or sorry, lunge forward uh, here in the basement. I won't do a step forward and a step back. I mainly did it in this way just for video purposes so that you can see. The going backwards is probably not that necessary to do. So if you were to do say 10 steps forward and 10 steps back, or sorry, 10 steps forward in one direction and then 10 steps forward in the other direction, that could count as your 20 reps in two or three sets. In this video, I'm using a kettlebell. You could use any sort of weight after you get comfortable with body weight. The next exercise we're gonna review is a deadlift. Now the deadlift should probably be done before you learn how to do a squat because it is all about learning to hinge at the hips, meaning sending your hips backwards while maintaining a neutral spine or i.e. a stacked up spine where the spine is straight, does not move between ear, shoulder, and hip. You will see with this deadlift, I'm using a kettlebell. If you have a barbell, that is great. If you have just a dumbbell, that's also usable. You'll see that with this exercise, for the most part, all the motion is in the hip. There's a little bit of motion through my low back as I lower that kettlebell straight down, and I'm keeping a relatively set, uh, straight set of legs with maybe 10, 15 degrees of motion. When you get to the top of that deadlift or at the top of the hip hinge, squeeze the glutes and push them forward without arching your spine backwards. It would feel like you're squeezing a penny between your butt cheeks. That is at the terminal of the end of that motion on the way up where you end up in that totally st uh, straight position, spine stacked and the pelvis is not pushing forward. It's just the glutes are clenched and contracted. Now, once you get really, really good at a deadlift, or that hip hinge, that's when you can start working on a kettlebell swing. The kettlebell swing is the exact same motion, but of course you're swinging a weight. This is one of those exercises that if you don't feel comfortable, you should probably or most certainly get somebody to help you with it. The principle is the exact same thing as the deadlift, where all of the motion or most of the motion is coming from the hips hinging. You have a little bit of bending at the knee, we'll call it five to 20 degrees, and that the kettlebell is being swung by the force in the legs and the glutes 
creating momentum and pushing it forward. There'll be a little bit of swing in the shoulders, but most of that momentum and force should be being generated by the glutes and the legs. Next exercise we're going to go over is just a simple uh, bent over row. You could also have your hand on some sort of bench or chair to provide a little bit of support so the low back isn't working as hard. The important thing with this is that the motion is being initiated by the shoulder blade and not by the elbow. So I'm thinking, okay, shoulder blade comes back and then I pull everything back and I'm trying to aim for the middle of my spine when I'm bent over, not up not low, right through the shoulder blade. So the shoulder blade and the arm come straight back, almost on the, a little bit lower than where the nipple is, that arm is coming straight back. For this exercise, like I said, uh, you could put support on a chair or a bench, but in this case, I have support on my knee. That will take some strain off your low back, though I do think it would be a good exercise to learn how to do without any support. That will help build some strength through the low back muscles, which are of course important for providing support when you are on the handlebars, especially in some sort of uh, off-road event. Second last exercise, guys, is a monster walk. Now, this could technically fit into our core exercise video that we already have online, but I have it in the strength category just because there's some movement associated with it and it's not a static hold. The monster walk is for the gluteus minimus and medius, building lateral stability, which will reduce the chances of the knees and the legs collapsing inwards, internally rotating, potentially pronating the feet. You can do it with or without a weight. I have a kettlebell in hand here. And the important thing that I would say with this is that uh, I am initiating the motion with my hip. Now, uh, for me, my cue is I will bring the leg or the foot straight out to the side while thinking about using my hip to initiate the motion. You can see with this exercise that I'm keeping a nice little squat. I'm doing the motion as slowly as I can to make sure that it's nice and stable. That's gonna help build more stability through those outer glute muscles, the lateral stabilizers. If you're finding this is too hard, then what I would recommend is you can move the resistance band higher. If it's on the knees as opposed to the toes as demonstrated here, that will be easier. If that is also hard, then you should probably go and check out our core exercise video, which I have linked, which is gonna help build more strength and stability in those glute muscles, in the obliques that we are using here. This exercise is similar to the lunge. If we do say 10 steps to the left, and 10 steps to the right, those would be our reps. And then you could do one, two, three, however many sets and reps as you need so that at the end of that last set, there is some fatigue building up. So we've saved the hardest exercise for last, which is a pistol squat or a single leg squat. This is a super hard exercise. I don't do it perfectly well in this. This is going to build more lateral stability uh, using the exact same muscles and core and hip stabilizers that we just used in the monster walk. A couple of cues for this are core is engaged. We want to make sure ear, shoulder, and hip stay in as straight of a line as possible. It's going to be tough to maintain a totally neutral spine, but you want to do your best to do so. Uh, in this case, the leg is out straight and you're really trying to use your butt as much as possible so that the knee you are descending on does not collapse inwards. You wanna go as low to the ground as possible. If your hip mobility is limited, this exercise is going to be very difficult, but I would say fret not. This is a little bit more advanced. I don't necessarily think a cyclist needs to be able to do this exercise, but it's one of those things that if you can do it, it reflects that your strength level is at a good level and that there is not too much on or off the bike that should hold you back in terms of requirements of glute, hip, core stability. Okay guys, thank you for tuning in to another video. Thanks for going through these uh, strengthening exercises that I think should be an important part of everybody's off season, which we're getting into here in Canada, and should also most likely be continued through the on season so that you don't lose those strength gains. 
If anybody's wondering, for me, I do these exercises typically after my bigger days. So let's say I've got a threshold or VO2 max effort, I will try to do these afterwards or in the afternoon. Uh, I don't like rolling into a threshold anaerobic VO2 exercise, or sorry, a workout with having done these the day before. I usually find those workouts do not go very well. Um, and I usually will do uh, these exercises if I'm doing them after uh, another type of workout, whether it's endurance or whatever, I always do them after so that it doesn't influence uh, my workout on the bike. And I usually don't find that the work on the bike limits my ability to do these exercises. Sometimes motivation, yes, but that's one of those things that I know in the end, if I do the exercises, I'm going to be a uh, bigger, faster, stronger cyclist, hopefully. Uh, and if not, somebody that's more resilient to injury on and off the bike. Guys, take care, like and subscribe if you think the video deserves it, and I will see you soon.